live on YouTube now and oh in a second. Okay, uh, let me start also the cloud recording. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello and welcome to the final mini course uh, in this week's uh, Oops. Uh, we are happy to have uh, Massimiliano Gubinelli from Bonn. And as usual, the lectures are being recorded. If you do not wish to appear, then turn off your camera and microphone, but you are free to unmute to ask questions if you wish or ask on the chat. And uh, we have the lecture today, Thursday and Friday at this time. Massimiliano, the floor is yours. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Omar. So thanks for to the organizer for for this opportunity. And um, so let, let's start. Um, yeah, so the title was very vague somehow, I, 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 because uh, my goal in these lectures, uh, so like three hours is, is not very much. So I, uh, but I, I think my, my main goal here is just to try to pass a message which I think important. Okay, so this is why I call this course like facets of stochastic quantization. Uh, so feel free to ask questions. I don't have any, any very strict plan. So here the outline essentially for today and maybe very vaguely from what's going on tomorrow and the day after. So I want just to introduce the setting today and um, explain uh, or give an idea of what are Euclidean quantum fields, and then what is stochastic quantization, what kinds of stochastic quantization you can do. There are several actually. And to me, this is useful because it gives you, by giving you various example, um, I somehow remove, try to remove from your mind uh, some preconceptions, okay? So that, that's the goal of giving these examples. And then I want to show you how to use stochastic quantization for proving probabilistic statements about certain family of measure, which are these Euclidean quantum fields. Okay, and then we will look to several kinds of property like infinite volume limit or the small scale limit. And then some other maybe more qualitative properties. And then if there is time or if there is interest, in the last lecture, I would like to discuss uh, um, this uh, one of these various kind of stochastic quantization, which is the elliptic one, because there is a nice relation to supersymmetry. I'm not sure if I'm going really to do that. It depends how fast or uh, I can go on the other material. There, there is a lot of material. Um, I gave uh, lectures in, Freib in, in February, sorry, in Milan a full course, like uh, maybe 20 hours. I don't remember exactly how many hours. And uh, you, you find uh, all the material, which are like notes and the script for the course here. So there you, you will find many details on many things which I cannot cover fully here, okay? Or just go on my webpage and, uh, and skim over my courses and you will find it, okay? So let's go on. Um, Okay, so the, the first thing I want to do is just to briefly introduce what are, uh, at least to me and in this lecture, Euclidean quantum fields. Okay, and uh, um, you have to you you have to think of them as a certain kind of Gibbs measure, which are formally. Uh, okay, this this is very formal. Okay, I'm just trying to give the flavor at this moment. So, okay, Gibbs measure, which correspond to a certain energy. So they, they are measure on distributions over the Euclidean space, the dimensional space. The dimension will play an important role, so keep it in mind. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they are 
intuitively described in this way. Okay, if you start to read a paper, this is usually the first formula you will see. I, I will try to motivate that what this formula should mean, of course, because it's not a rigorous formula in the sense that, because you don't have the Lebesgue measure and on distribution, you cannot really compute these quantities for various reasons, because uh, first of all, because actually, the sample paths that we, we will see this later on, but essentially the, the, the sample path of, of this uh, random field is really not a function uh, almost surely. So you cannot really compute the square or you cannot compute any other meaningful local function. And, uh, and certainly you cannot integrate this object in the full space because somehow these functions, this random field are supposed to be Euclidean invariant and therefore if they fluctuate, they fluctuate everywhere in the same fashion. So there is no reason this norm, these global norms should be well-defined. Okay, and uh, I, as you see, the, I, I put it in, in the first slide because it is already highlight two important problems that we will have to overcome uh, in trying to study this measure. And then you have a large scale problem for example, because this integral does not make sense. This is a similar problem you have in statistical mechanics when you try to define Gibbs measure in lattice spin system. You want to have an Hamiltonian, which is extensive, therefore it grows like the volume. So if the volume is infinite, the energy is infinite essentially. So you need a smarter way to try to make sense of what is a Gibbs measure in this context due to the fact that you have this non-compact uh, um, index space, if you want. And then you have, a, in this context, more on top of the infrared problem, you have the ultraviolet problem that is, uh, as I told you, as already uh, um, said or suggested, the sample path of the typical realization of these random fields, which we want to study and construct are not uh, functions, they are distribution of negative regularity, so they cannot really be computed in points, okay? You can only evaluate them uh, by integrating over uh, against uh, nice test functions. Okay, and there is some history, so why we are interested in this kind of measure, okay? And the idea, uh, very briefly, okay, I cannot uh, cannot do it more in detail, and that's not the point. I just want to give you some hints of what's uh, there and why we are going to do something. Um, so the, the history essentially is comes from quantum mechanics and from the rigorous construction of models of quantum mechanics, which are compatible with special relativity meaning you, you, you want to constrain signal to have a finite speed and moreover, the, the symmetry group of your model should be the Poincare group of Minkowski space in some very precise sense. Um, and this gives rise somehow, uh, this was understood by physicists in the 20, 30 and uh, and this gives rise to essentially quantum mechanics with infinitely many degrees of freedom, okay? Because, because we have finite speed of signal, so somehow this, uh, uh, this uh, somehow constraint the, the fact that uh, degrees of freedom have to be independent in different regions of space, and space, it's unlimited. Um, Whiteman axioms. So then mat mathematician or mathematical physicists try to make sense of the construction of the physicist and the quantum field theory by trying to give a series of axioms and proving that somehow there, there are models satisfying these axioms. And these are called what, the Whiteman axioms. And essentially it's the bare minimum a quantum field theory should satisfy. Okay? And uh, I will not enter into them. The, the point is that you write down the axiom and then you realize that it's difficult to find models uh, for such axioms, okay? So mathematical objects which satisfy all the axioms. And certainly not in the real Minkowski space where you have uh, n is the dimension of the space, of the, of the space and one is the time, okay? so. 
people try, manage to find example in one space dimension and one time dimension in the 60s. So really construct operator, Hilbert spaces, observable and realization of the symmetry group by a unitary operator, uh, only in this very restricted context. And uh, uh, after some time, it was found that somehow through a process of analytic continuation of certain quant of observable of quantum mechanics, essentially um, this, uh, this analytic continuation gave rise to correlation function of a probability measure on a d-dimensional space, okay? So the idea is that when you, you essentially formally, if you take Minkowski space and you, you send the time into an imaginary time, then the Minkowski metric become Euclidean because the sign of the last component change. And essentially your n plus one dimensional Minkowski space become an Euclidean space. And this procedure can be made rigorous and it, it is rigorously implemented via this theorem of Osterwald and Schrader, which give you necessary and sufficient condition to be able to do this uh, analytic continuation. Okay, and, uh, and construct a model which satisfy Whiteman axiom from a probabilistic object. And let's keep in mind, because this will be the center of this lecture, somehow one of the high point of this program of constructive quantum field theory that is construct mathematically rigorous model satisfying the axioms from quantum field theory has been the construction of this, uh, of a specific model, which is called 543. Okay, which we will discuss all along the lecture, so I don't introduce right now. Um, so the point is uh, a problem in quantum mechanics become a problem in probability. Now, what is this problem in probability? Well, the point, essentially I, I resume the, the, the situation and the difficulties in this slide. Okay, in order to be able to use this theorem of Osterwald de Schrader and construct a model of the Whiteman axiom and uh, so a quantum field theory in the, in the quantum mechanical sense, you should be able to find a probability measure on distributions uh, so this is the, the Schwarz space uh, over Rd. So you, you, you define a probability measure on that. And this probability measure has to satisfy three properties, at least these three properties, okay? These are like the, the condensation of what are really the ingredients going into a quantum field theory from this probabilistic perspective. And, uh, the first axiom is a regularity property. You, you should be able somehow to have, a, you see this measure should be able to integrate certain norm, exponential of a norm of the field. And this is some norm on distribution. Okay, think about it as a, um, yeah, some norm on the space of distribution. Okay, distribution uh, S prime is a Frechy space. So it has a, is, is defined via seminorm, but uh, you can take one of these seminorm of, or you, you can take this seminorm and construct a norm, uh, which is not intrinsic to S prime, but uh, somehow it's, it's enough to say that distribute, so the sample distributions under this measure have certain regularity. And uh, uh, moreover, the, the measure a certain integrability for these norms, okay? And this is a technical step which is important and needed for, uh, in order to be able to, to go back to the real space, to the real Minkowski space, the analytic continuation. And then other two important property which are natural. So, okay, the, the second is natural. So you need the Euclidean invariance, covariance. So now this measure should be invariant under translation of the Euclidean space. So it's a measure on distribution. So you can act on them by translating the test function. And then when you translate the test function, you get a random variable by testing with the random uh, field. And then you want that this is the law of this 
uh, random variable is invariant under translation. Okay, and this corresponds to the Poincare invariance when you go back to recover the original uh, the original quantum field theory. And the last property, which is uh, which is has been actually discovered in this process to really try to implement this analytic continuation rigorously is this reflection positivity, which is a strange property of a measure. So it's, it can be stated in a probabilistic language. I'm, I'm very brief, so please ask question. If you feel puzzled, try to give you the main points here. So, uh, so a measure, it's reflection positive. In this case, you I, I just consider reflection in the first coordinate of Rd. So you, you just consider this transformation theta, which invert the sign of the first coordinate. And then you take essentially a functional of the random field, but you, you think the random field restricted on test function supported in the sub uh, space where the first coordinate is positive. Okay, so when you apply theta to these test functions, they become supported in the negative, okay? And then you, you consider a generic functional of the distribution, okay? Essentially consider, think about cylindrical functional, that is you, you take a bunch of test functions supported on the positive, uh, on the positive um, half space, and then uh, you test the random field with them and you, you take a generic uh, smooth function of these evaluations. And then you see, you take this, you, you take, so this will be the result of computing F over phi and then you compute F over theta phi, okay? Where you apply theta to all the test functions. In this way, so now you, you are looking at some, functional of your random feed, but only looking essentially what happens in a half space. And then you multiply with somehow the mirror image of this functional in the other support, which is supported in the other half, other half space. And this quantity has to be positive also with complex conjugation if, if you consider complex functionals. Okay, so this is reflection positivity. It's a strange property, but essentially the, the usefulness is that it allows you to introduce a scalar product, which then will give the scalar product in the of the Hilbert space after the reconstruction. So here I gave a very simple example. What does it mean to be reflection positive for a measure mu? Think about a measure which is supported on function by simplicity. So you just compute the random field on a point, then you compute the random field on the reflected point, and this product has to be positive for any choice of uh, this number when x1 is positive, okay? And then, of course, you have higher order. You, uh, the function f can be like a linear function or can be a quadratic function or a cubic function, whatever, provided the integrability is satisfied. And then, for example, you will have higher order like a constraint from this reflection positivity. So my point with this slide is just to make you notice that uh, actually what makes difficult uh, our job is that we need these um, three properties. So, so, so there's a question in the chat. Uh... Yeah, what is the meaning of X1? Sorry, yeah, thanks. So X1 is just the first coordinate of a point, okay? So this, uh, yeah, here I say the, so here I gave an example where I can compute the distribution on a point. So really think about uh, this as really being uh, phi of delta, uh, if you want something like this. Imagine I can do that. Of course, if you cannot do then, uh, then you, you will have to use a test function, but let, let's imagine that I can compute the distribution on the delta function and on, on the point. So this is a point on, on Rd, okay? So that, that is the meaning. Um, so these are distribution on Rd, but if I assume they are also function, they are functions on Rd, and I can compute them in a given point of Rd, and uh, X1 is just the first coordinate, okay? You just, you didn't, uh, I didn't want to say anything more than that, okay? Um, 
And uh, yeah, so th these three properties are, um, yeah, they, they, they somehow go one against each other. And uh, if you start to think about example of measure which satisfy these three properties, because you want to implement this, um, this program of uh, Euclidean quantum field theory, then essentially there are very few examples we can construct. So if you want the surprising thing is, I write down these three properties and actually the two difficult one are Euclidean covariance and reflection positivity. So you ask, okay, what are the measures which are Euclidean covariant and reflection positive and, uh, and live on at least on distributions? Okay, so this is a meaningful probabilistic question. Okay, there is no, I will not discuss any more quantum field theory. Okay, from the point of view of probabilist, this is the setting. I want a measure which has these three properties. Then you start to look around and there are not many measures with a, which have this property. Actually, um, first example, Gaussian measure. So if you look into Gaussian measure, essentially, it means uh, in particular that the covariance, uh, yeah, okay, let, let me state it briefly because somehow we need only essentially the, this idea. When you look into Gaussian measure, uh, you start to realize that reflection positivity really it's a very hard constraint on the measure because for example, it single out the Gaussian free field, the, the massive Gaussian free field, okay? Essentially is more or less the only example of a Gaussian measure uh, which is reflection positive, okay? The Gaussian free field and linear combinations somehow Gaussian on independent Gaussian free fields are reflection positive and Euclidean covariant. Um, and uh, essentially they are the only, uh, the only known examples. Uh, David Bridges is in the audience. He can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Uh, or maybe add comment in the chat if you want to point, make some points. But uh, as far as I understood, uh, this is the case. Um, so what is the Gaussian free field? Because we, we will encounter later, uh, later on in this lecture. So the Gaussian free field, it's the measure on distribution, the Gaussian measure on distribution, which has this covariance. Okay, so the, the covariance is, is a, is a distribution which depends only on the difference of, of the position and it's given by the green function, uh, the, 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 the resolvent of, of the Laplacian on the full space, okay, in the dimension. And, and essentially I wrote it here, okay, you, you can check by yourself if you try to compute this green function that if you compute it in zero, maybe because you want to try to compute the, the variance of, of of this uh, of the Gaussian free field, uh, you you get infinity in dimension bigger or equal than two, meaning okay, meaning that it's not a function. Okay, it's not the proof, but essentially this hints to the fact that the Gaussian free field in two and more dimension is not a function. It's a genuine distribution, and this will be part of our problems. Okay, so already in the Gaussian context reflection positivity and essentially translation invariance could cause the sample path of um, the this, of of this random field to be not functions okay to be real distributions okay so you see that this difficulty are are coming uh, to us uh, as soon as we try to make things compatible with this uh, with these requirements, okay? Uh, unfortunately, the Gaussian free field, which is very important, very easy to study in some ways, it's not all that it's interesting for us because somehow if you implement the program for the Gaussian free field, you come up with a quantum field theory, which is, um, which is free. Um, Ah, okay, yeah, okay. There are comments of David. Uh, uh, free field to get example, but uh, still Gaussian. Yeah, so uh, 
yeah okay yeah thanks so so now you we we still are in the same context they are not the interesting measure let me say in this way thanks uh, david for the punctualization in the chat um yeah he, he was saying uh, somehow that but this i i noted here so somehow you of course you can make linear combinations of gaussian free field with different masses and also you can construct other fields which are like functionals of the Gaussian free field, but in some way they, they are, um, yeah, they, they are not very interesting for other reasons. So let me try to convey what should, how should look like an interesting function, uh, a, an interesting measure. And so now the idea is that, okay, let, let's move away from Gaussian measure, but you have to keep reflection positivity. And one idea to keep reflection positivity and reflection positivity in some way, it's related to some kind of Markoviality. So uh, one robust recipe to maintain reflection positivity is like take a reflection positive measure, think about the Gaussian free field and then perturb it with a, a Gibbs weight. Okay, so you just do a, like a Gibbs, standard Gibson perturbation with an energy, which is a, an integral over a domain. And if you choose this domain in such a way that is symmetric with respect to theta, that is you can decompose it into two parts and these two parts are sent one into another by, by the reflection. Um, then essentially you can write the integral, let, let's say I can write this local function. Okay, I already told you that the, the Gaussian free field uh, is not a function, but let's say that I can write something like this and why I want to do that? Well, because uh, in this case, I could uh, split this integral in two integrals. And then when I try to check the reflection positivity for the full measure, uh, this boils down to the reflection positivity of the base measure mu, okay, from this very simple computation. And again, as far as I know, I understand about this topic, which is uh, was there since uh, since essentially Osteva de uh, This is one of the way you can construct a new reflection um, positive measure starting from a given one. Okay, and you see it's elementary, but again, okay, the reflection positivity, it's not an easy property to check. So essentially the idea when you are dealing with reflection positivity is uh, either you, you can really uh, put the hands on the measure so that you, you can really do these very easy arguments or it's essentially impossible to prove that a given measure it's reflection positive, okay? Because it's a, it's a very strange condition. Uh, which which is totally non-trivial. So the idea is that we have uh, we have uh, we understand that Gaussian measure are reflection positive. We understand that when we do Gibson perturbation in a certain way, we can hope to maintain reflection positivity. Of course, this argument is not rigorous, but it can be made rigorous. And the idea is essentially what I try to convey in this slide. And that's all, okay? There, there are no other ways to construct more reflection positive measure apart what David mentioned that is taking this, um, like taking a random field, for example, you can consider the Gaussian free field and then consider the square of the Gaussian free field properly defined. And then this will give you another um, reflection positive measure, which is non Gaussian because the square of the Gaussian free field is non Gaussian. Okay, but we are going to follow this strategy. Okay, we want to construct non-Gaussian, let's say I want to construct a non-Gaussian measure uh, given by Gibson perturbation of the Gaussian free field. Okay, so that's why I want to do that. Well, because that's the only somehow interesting way to obtain uh, reflection positive measures. But what is the problem here? Well. Okay, I can hope to make sense of all of these. For example, on the lattice, I will mention this very soon. Only if, of course, this integral is well defined. So at least I have to take a bounded uh, domain and this breaks the Euclidean invariance. Okay, so if you take lambda to be a bounded domain, then your measure is not Euclidean invariant anymore. 
So you 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 may be able to maintain reflection positivity, but you don't have uh, Euclidean invariance. So we we have to do a more complex uh, strategy, and the strategy go through three steps. And the idea is that okay, let's let's uh, simplify the matter a bit. We we work on a lattice instead of working in the full Euclidean space. Lattice spacing I call epsilon. And then I make even periodic so that I, I have a finite box of size L. And, uh, and then the idea is uh, that you somehow can make sense of the Gaussian free field in this context, because somehow the Gaussian free field is just the Gaussian field related to the result whose covariance is given by the resolvent of the Laplacian. And you have the Laplacian in this, on this, uh, uh, finite box. So you, you essentially can construct the Gaussian free field and you can construct perturbation of the Gaussian free field. And I essentially wrote it down that in this case, you can write down everything rigorously. And uh, it's, it's just a, a measure on a finite dimensional Euclidean space. And uh, you can check that it's reflection positive for the appropriate definition of reflection positivity in a, in a periodic setting and also translation invariant because of the lattice, of the periodicity of the lattice. Okay, so somehow this is an approximation of an Euclidean quantum field theory in the sense that it maintains reflection positivity and translation invariance, at least in an approximate way, but that's the good way which can pass to the limit. Okay, so trust me that uh, you are not lost much. Of course, you have lost something because you, you have introduced a lattice where before you have an Euclidean space, so you lost rotation. Okay, the lattice situation is not rotation invariant anymore. So we don't have the full Euclidean group. We have only translations and actually even only discrete translation and periodic ones. Um, and uh, somehow we don't know a way to somehow approximate uh, the kind of measure we want to construct in such a way to maintain all the property we need. Okay, so somehow I feel more uh, interesting to keep reflection positivity because that's hard to get in the limit, to keep translation invariance because this is easy to get, and rotation that's a uh, a negative point of this approximation, you lost it and you only will be able to recope to recover them in the limit uh, when you remove the, let, the, the spacing on, on the, in the lattice. And you see that here what I put, well, I put the, this is the quadratic uh, density for the Gaussian measure for the Gaussian free field. And uh, this is the integral the, the discrete version of, of this perturbation, which I introduced the other uh, in, the, in the previous slide. And one can check as an exercise that this, uh, okay, it's, maybe it's not a full exercise, but if you assume that the Gaussian part, it's reflection positive, then it's easy to check then, you know, the other part is also, I mean, with, the, with this perturbation is also reflection positive for any function V that you like. Okay, there is no restriction on the function V, uh, provided this, of course, this measure makes sense. So you, you introduce this approximation, you want to take the limit as epsilon and L goes to zero because you want the full translation invariance and the, uh, of the model and also the full reflection positivity and not the only the one which is modified to deal with the torus situation. So the idea is that we want to remove both parameters. Epsilon has to go to zero, L has to go to infinity. So to, to look at all this bunch of measures all together, you just embed them in the space of distribution by defining a distribution by just testing, you, you see in the, in, on the lattice, okay? So you just take the test function, you evaluate in the point of the lattice, and then you multiply with the value of the random field, this discrete random field in that point, okay? And you define, you this, this extends somehow any random field defined on this space as a distribution on the, uh, on the Euclidean space. 
Uh, yeah, and then I call epsilon uh, ultraviolet regularization and L an infrared one. Okay, and then the third step. Uh, now, what you want to do is that you want to send epsilon to zero, L to infinity, in such a way that the limit, that you get an interesting limit out of this procedure, okay? And uh, so this is the only constraint, okay? For me, this is important for you. Uh, for me, this is important that you understand that because this then give me the freedom to choose the function V as I like, okay? Because somehow I don't have other constraints than that. I just want to take the limit. I want the limit to exist and to be non-Gaussian so that I, I obtain something interesting because my hope essentially is that whenever I obtain something interesting in the limit, I will be able to prove that it's an Euclidean quantum field theory. And then I will be able to run the machinery and get a quantum field theory out of that and eventually study the property of this quantum field theory. Okay, but let's discuss only the probabilistic part. And what is important for me is that I have full freedom to choose this function as I want. And what we are going to do because I, I don't want to discuss all the possibilities you have, but let's say we will restrict ourselves to D equal two and three, especially three maybe because it's a more interesting situation for us. Uh, and take V to be a quartic polynomial. Well, it, it has to be somehow a, a function bounded below, otherwise you have already problem by defining this measure here. Okay, if this function is not bounded below, you have a minus sign. So that, that's make easy to define this function. Maybe you, we want a polynomial for other reason because we will need to do very explicit computation. So with polynomials are easier. And so you don't have many choices. So you need an even polynomial. And then uh, there are reason I choose four. And so the reason I, so this is called, with this specific choice, this is called like the four, five, four D measure, D is two or three. And then the, the task will be, okay, choose this coefficient in such a way, you can introduce also the other terms, okay? They would not change very much the situation. So let me just simplify. I need to introduce, I cannot just take the four power. We will see later on that we will have really to introduce a, also the second power and adjusted in such a way that the limit, we are able to prove that the limit exists and it's non-trivial, okay? If you don't do that, uh, the limit become trivial, okay? If you don't adjust this, this coefficient. But uh, again, okay, this is, should not be thought as a strange thing. If you think about our motivation, you have the freedom to choose whatever you want and this works. And actually in three dimension is essentially the only a recipe that we know it works. For two dimensions, other choices are possible and studied very well in the literature. You can take a trigonometric functions. You, you, you cannot take everything, but you can take a large class of functions, okay? Or exponential or linear combination. You can also take linear combination of trigonometric exponential like here, for example, or polynomial provided you have still this higher degree to be uh, even. Okay, so lambda is always, uh, yeah, lambda is for me a positive quantity. Okay, so I, I again, for D equal three, the only full construction it has been done in the literature is for the fourth order. Uh, you could think about the sixth order, which is uh, called uh, critical model that's more difficult to discuss. And as far as I know, there are no results in this direction. Uh, in dimension four, uh, yeah, in dimension four, for the fourth power, uh, essentially there is this very nice recent work of uh, Eisenman and Dominic Copan, which they proved that if you get a limit, then the limit is Gaussian, okay? So in fourth dimension, there is this problem of triviality, which means if you try to follow this procedure and uh, uh, there, there is no way to choose a function we in such a way that we know how to take the limit and the limit is not trivial. Um, mm, 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, as uh, David precise, if we don't put the, this factor here, uh, you, you can take the limit, but the limit is trivial. Okay, so it's, uh, it's just a concentrated, uh, it's not a random field which has fluctuations, let's say, concentrated on the constant random field. Um, and again, in dimension four, uh, this procedure is not known to give interesting results. Okay, every limit is, is Gaussian. So that, that's a problem because somehow dimension four correspond to real space. Okay, real, when you go back to Minkowski space is the three dimensional space. So essentially scalar Euclidean quantum field theories are, are not very good uh, candidates for um, for a theory of quantum fields, essentially. Okay, but le let's go back to our situation. So I will concentrate most of the lecture on, the, on this polynomial case, okay, in two and three dimension. And now I want to discuss uh, um, what it's meant by stochastic quantization, okay? And uh, I somehow in, in this my point in this lecture is really that I want to stress one specific way to understand stochastic quantization, which it's important to me, and I feel somehow underappreciated maybe in the community. Um, and so, what is our goal as probabilists? As probabilists, now I introduce the problem. We are given this family of measure which I described below, above, and I want to take this limit. I want to have tools, I want to develop theory to be able to take the limit epsilon going to zero and the limit uh, L goes to infinity. Okay, so these are the two limits which interest us and obtain some measure in the limit. And then I want to study this measure and want to say this measure is not Gaussian, this measure has a certain regularity and so on and so forth, okay? and. Uh, this problem has been solved by developing a lot of technology and a lot of uh, very nice new mathematics in the 70s and in the 80s by uh, a large series of authors, starting with the work on Gleam and Jaffe. Um, David in, in the audience also gave an important contribution and many others. Okay, I don't I want to do this, this review here. I will give you literature later on. Uh, but somehow they use more technique related to statistical mechanics and to functional integration somehow. So they, they just wrote down the measure and then the measure, it's a good measure. And if you start to think about this measure in this way, there are many inter many natural things you, are, you want to do. You want to do cluster expansion. You want to do um, this kind of, of strategies, which we know already from the discrete spin systems. Uh, so this stochastic, yeah, let, let, me, uh, let me say that this is not really new. Parisi, Wu, and Nelson, in some ways, uh, in the 80s, introduced this idea of stochastic quantization, okay? So stochastic quantization is this idea that you, I want to study the measure by looking at an auxiliary object, which is a stochastic differential equation. So Parisi Wu, what they were doing, they were really proposing that for other reasons and deeper reasons somehow that I don't want to touch here related to gauge theories. But somehow the, the core of the idea is that, okay, the measure, the measure I, want to the, I want to study, it's defined to me, for me, as the invariant measure of a stochastic differential equation, okay? So, and the stochastic differential equation is just the solution of an equation of this form, okay? It's just, uh, it's an SDE where you have uh, some drift and you, I, I wrote it in, in this naive way where, because I wanted to see the um, space-time white noise here. So you have to think in this way, that is, uh, you have a space-time white noise and then you try to solve this, uh, Stochastic differential equation and essentially a well-known result, at least in the in the finite dimensional setting, is that if you start, if you start, uh, well, this is let, let, let's discuss this situation in the case of 
the regularization okay so four things happening on the discrete setting so x is just a point in the lattice in, in my lattice so let me just uh, sorry. let me just um yeah i want this lattice so let me introduce this notation uh, this is my lattice it's a finite dimensional set so for any x you have uh, uh, a Brownian motion whose derivative is a white noise in time. So time is continuous, but space is discrete. Okay. And then this is really a system of ODEs uh, for a, a non uh, stochastic process, which is indexed also by this discrete position in space. And the idea is that if you start, for example, okay, why this is related with the measure nu uh, L epsilon is because the measure nu it's the invariant measure of this equation that is if you start with the initial condition distributed like the measure nu then uh yeah uh then uh, the law of the process at every time is given by this invariant measure okay so that that was their proposal so I, I will discuss, essentially I will end the lecture discussing this point. Okay, so um, don't worry if you didn't get it. So th this is, uh, sorry, what is S? S is all this object, okay? Let me just go back. So S is this function and you, you take the gradient of this function. And if you use, uh, if you look at SD, which has the gradient of this function, as a drift with appropriately choose Brownian motion, then essentially this measure is the invariant measure for the dynamics. Okay, that's the connection of the, dyna of the dynamics. And um, yeah, so I spelled it out. So how does it look like? Well, it looks like an equation which is some kind of parabolic, okay? Because when you try to take the the, the the gradient of this function, then the quadratic part give you this, uh, this somehow linear part, and then you have the potential V whose derivative give you this probably nonlinear component. So this is a nonlinear SD uh, with a linear part, which looks like a parabolic equation. So this is a discrete parabolic SPD. But just to keep in mind that we, when we will take the continuum limit, this will become a parabolic equation. And essentially the idea is that, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the measure nu it's distribute is essentially the law of the solution at time t for any time if you start from the invariant measure. If you don't start from the invariant measure, what you can prove usually is that when time goes to infinity, whatever it was your initial condition, if you are in the good setting, whatever it's your initial condition, uh, when time goes to infinity, the, the invariant, uh, the solution, of the law of the solution of this as the converge to uh, the, the measure nu epsilon, which is essentially the only invariant measure for these dynamics. Okay, so now this is not very important to me, so we will never take this limit in, in the following, okay? So the limit T goes to, you, you, are, you would like to keep in mind that you can take the limit, but that's not important for us in this lecture, okay? So the idea is now to use this equation to take the limit and why it's a good idea, okay? It seems to make things more complicated. Um, and the point I want to make, so I will spend the last, uh, uh, the time it remains in this lecture to discuss this point. Uh, the point I want to make, which is important to me, is that I want to sell you, you know, so stochastic quantization as a stochastic analysis of Euclidean quantum field theories, quantum field section. Okay, so I want to explain what does it mean, okay? Because, uh, I feel, because I can enter into the technical details, but uh, by discussing with people and also discussing paper and see the papers that are published or the kind of question people try to study. 
So my feel to me important to stress that what is what is interesting to me in this stuff and this subject is that what Parisi Vu introduced without saying in this way, actually, maybe they didn't even think to, to this kind of equation in this way, but for me, it's a way of, it's a stochastic analysis for Euclidean uh, quantum fields. So what does it mean? Well, uh, okay, let me, I will discuss it later. So uh, let me stress one point before I enter into this, uh, which is related. So when you introduce this equation, so the important point is not that you introduce the equation, but uh, it can be overlooked. Uh, but the, to me, the important point is that you introduce a new object, which is this additional noise, okay? So somehow what you are doing is that you, the, the, what, this stochastic quantization is doing is that you describe a measure with an SD, but okay, what is an SD or what is the solution of an SD? Well, it's a functional of the noise you put into the SD. Okay, so the stochastic quantization actually identify a functional, which I call it uh, G here, which send the noise or yet yeah, here there is also the initial condition which has to be dealt but let's ignore for a moment essentially this functional take your noise which is a gaussian white noise so a very simple object in some sense and somehow make out of it a new random field which has the law which has the distribution you want okay so that what it's really accomplished by gaussian by stochastic quantization this you can look at it as a tool. And then the kind of theorem I would like to sketch the proof along this lecture looks like this. Uh, take dimension three and the fourth or the polynomial and choose appropriately the constant I epsilon, which should depend on epsilon. Then, then you can take the limit epsilon going to zero, L to go to infinity, L to infinity and find a measure new, which is, uh, somehow stationary in space. Oh, sorry. Uh, and this measure nu is the a stationary solution for the equivalent continuum dynamics, okay? So as you, you can take the limit also in the dynamics and track the dynamics to the limit. Uh, and while this dynam the discrete dynamics is very easy to describe because if here you put a polynomial, here you will have a polynomial, nothing very fancy happening. When you take the limit, so now we will have to discuss more in detail what happens to this polynomial because uh, in the limit, the solution will be really space-time distribution. Actually, a continuous function of time with value in the distribution. And then it will have an invariant measure nu. And this invariant measure is a non-Gaussian Euclidean quantum field theory. But we, okay, in the kind of theory I want to show you, you, you will not be able to prove rotation invariance. This is still a missing ingredient. And you can somehow describe it in some way by giving an integration by parts form. Okay. It's not important we enter into it right now. I think in the third lecture, I, I will explain exactly what is this integration by part formula. But just to say that this measure can be described um, in, in, in very concrete terms, if you want. And then, um, okay, so maybe I take, uh, yeah, 15 minutes to finish uh, the, this part. So le let me discuss what is stochastic analysis, because I, I want to try to convince you that we are, what we are really doing is the stochastic analysis of Euclidean quantum field theories. I told you what is an Euclidean quantum field theory. Now I want to, I have to explain what is stochastic analysis, at least in, in the context I want to discuss. And then, okay, if you think what is stochastic analysis, well, usually it's uh, Ito calculus. There is also Malyavan calculus, but le let's stick to Ito calculus. And then if you try to look historically what happened and why Ito and Dublin uh, at the same time stumbled over Ito calculus, you, you realize that they, what Ito was trying to do is trying to construct 
a probability measure, which was a continuous Markov process, a, di a diffusion. Okay. And okay, how you recognize that you have constructed such a probability measure? Well, because it satisfies such family of kernels, well, because they satisfy chapman kolmogorov equation. Okay, so they, they have a certain relation among themselves. They satisfy certain global property, which is chapman kolmogorov equation. And other regularity properties, which tells you that they are continuous sample paths. Okay, and then you try, okay, how I construct them. And then Ito has this idea that he, he started to analyze uh, continuous Markov process and he identified what was the tangent process. Okay, so what happened infinitesimally when you try to move the time in a Markov process. And then the, the tangent process uh, in, in the continuous setting at least is given by the Brunel motion. Okay, we all know that. And then he constructed stochastic calculus as a machinery which go from the local behavior, this tangent process, to the global behavior that is the, the, the process itself and its slow. Okay, so I want to look at this process in this way. And this is an analysis, okay? You, you have analysis and synthesis, okay? You, you analyze your problem, you identify a simple ingredient, a logically simple ingredient, and then you want to relate the global picture with the local picture, okay? The, 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 anal the, uh, the analysis with the synthesis, okay? You have this two step always around. And uh, of course, you have classical analysis. Okay, in classical analysis, you have polynomials, which they de describe the local behavior. And then calculus and Taylor expansion give you the link between the two. Okay. Um, and I, I already mentioned that uh, what is the situation in Ito calculus. Okay, you have Ito calculus, you have stochastic Taylor expansion and Brownian motion, and its functionals play the role of what it's played by polynomials in the standard setting. And then, so let, let me just resume very vaguely because this is like meta mathematics, it's not mathematics, but if you want to do analysis, you need to find a, a change parameter, something that you can very uh, slowly to see what's going to change in a very simple way. And then suitable building block for this infinitesimal change. Okay, and then you can give, I, I have in mind other examples of which enter into, fit into this, into this framework. Okay, rough path, if you know rough path or regularity structure. If you think about SLE, it enters into this matter, okay, at least in, in some way, okay. The SLE is a building block for conformal random fields. Okay, and um, it, Sorry, actually, Brunner motion is a building block for conformal random field, and and somehow the the tool you use to link the two is a, is a SLE, um, and uh, so so this is the situation I was mentioning. We have various uh, uh, topics like what is the object you want to study, either a Markov diffusion or planet orbit, like in Newton's problem. Uh, so you have a global description, which is just how it's the planet orbit and what is the equation of the planet orbit. Or in the case of a Markov diffusion, you have a family of kernel with, um, with chapman kolmogorov equation. And then you have a change parameter and it's time in both ways, but T is just the param a parameter which parameterizes the, the orbit, okay? And then you, you, you want to analyze, you want to have a local description, okay? And locally, somehow things change linearly in the motion of planet orbits because motion is regular. And if you start to study, this is what Ito did, he started to try to understand what is the diffusion locally. And well, the diffusion locally looks like Gaussian. Okay, and then the building block here it's the Brunel motion, and here are polynomials. And then you have somehow uh, a way to, you need a way to construct the global object from the local object or to analyze. And uh, in Newton calculus, you have ODEs or you have uh, 
differential equations. And in ITO calculus, you have SDs, okay? So you solve an SD and you obtain a Markov process in the end, starting from a Brownian motion, okay? So now I want to make the parallel with stochastic quantization. Okay, so because I, I said it's it's a stochastic analysis of Euclidean quantum field, so the object is the Euclidean quantum field. And uh, so the global description, essentially here, I, I have this only very vague global description. I don't have, uh, of course, here I can say, um, uh, Markov diffusion is a family of kernel which satisfy uh, Chapman Kolmogorov. Here I can say a quantum field. I, I define at the beginning of the lecture, it's a probability measure that satisfies a certain number of properties. And uh, now you want to study. Okay, now this is a bit different. So now you, you have a change, I have to identify a change parameter. Here it's intrinsic, okay? Markov diffusion as a notion of change. Let me say that uh, in the in Newton calculus, so the planetary orbit motion, you could say it has a change parameter, which is intrinsic, but you can also say it's a parameterization of the orbit. So maybe it's not so intrinsic, okay? And uh, in stochastic quantization, the parameter is extrinsic, it's not present in the original problem, it's added, it's a new time. And the idea is that you somehow you you want um, yeah you you try to uh, see what happens so you you introduce actually the, this flow which has new as invariant measure and then when you make a small change in in the in the in the solution of this flow then you identify somehow a building block which is the Gaussian the dynamics of the Gaussian free field. Okay, you, you should think that as you have the dynamics of, um, yeah, of the full measure that we want to study, you can also introduce the dynamics of the Gaussian free field, okay, which just is a linear equation. And that's my what I want to see as a building block, okay, and which is similar to as a, um, so on the Ito calculus way, it's a Brunel motion. Um, and um, yeah, so, and then what is the global to lo global, uh, sorry, local to global link? Well, the link is given by the, um, by the stochastic quantization equation. Okay, so it's not that you can say things that correspond to things, but somehow, uh, the idea is that uh, I want to identify these objects and uh, somehow in any kind of analysis, I expect this object to be present. And if I want to interpret stochastic quantization as stochastic analysis, somehow this is the natural way to do that. Okay, so this is uh, the building block. So what is somehow the Brownian motion in the, in the ethos calculus, you, you should think to have it in the form of a Gaussian, of the Gaussian free field or some enhancement of the Gaussian free field with maybe some additional time parameter, uh, additional parameter. The, the key point is that you have to introduce this additional parameter in this case, because it's not intrinsic. And then the global to local link, here it's made by a stochastic differential equation and here it's made by an equation which somehow links the building block to the global description. Does not seem so, but if you think about it, whenever you have a Gaussian free field, it's the same thing as having the noise which drives the Gaussian free field, and the same noise enters the equation, which then gives rise to this measure as invariant measure. Um, okay, so I think we are in a good point to uh, maybe I take five minutes to just conclude because I want at least to, to arrive to this point. So let me just to compare, okay, to make the point where we are, okay, what, what kind of mathematics we want to do. Well, we want to bridge to, to, uh, to mathematical universe. One is the one which, for example, is exemplified in this slide by 
the book of review your okay this book you have 600 pages and essentially what it happens in 600 pages is that you discuss continuous uh, martingales brownian motion functionals of brownian motion using the tools of stochastic calculus and of martingale theory okay and these tools were developed starting from ito introduction of stochastic calculus but to do stochastic analysis okay so this the yellow book is stochastic analysis of brownian motion and this brown book is a uh, is the book of Glim and Jeff, which essentially um, make uh, an exposition of, of uh, the Euclidean quantum field theory, if you want. Okay, there, there is also the connection with quantum physics, of course, in this book, it's very interesting, but essentially it takes the point of view of Euclidean quantum field theory and try to use it to prove things in quantum mechanics. Okay, and you see that there is something strange going on, okay, because this book, which is on a very more complicated subject, is essentially as long as that book. Okay, and so in my mind, uh, this book should be a lot longer. And uh, so I feel that, that there are many things that uh, could be understood better, or could be understood in ways that it's easier to then explain to students in in this context. Okay, and but. It, if you would like, so what I'm trying to convey in this lecture is that, that I expect that there should be very interesting thing happening if you really try to bridge these two books, okay, and and together. And what I'm trying to explain in this lecture is how an attempt, okay, how to bridge these two universes, okay, so so to to build a stochastic analysis of quantum fields, and just to dispel the fact that. Stoka so I, I want to dispel this idea that stochastic quantization is only about uh, invariant measure of Markov process, okay? It's not what I meant in this lecture, it's not what I think it's important. Stochastic quantization is what I told you, okay? It's to identify, so it's a way to identify a change parameter, a local description, building block and local to global link for Euclidean quantum field theories. And uh, I can substantiate a bit more this idea, giving you many ways to do this, okay? There is not one only way to introduce this additional structure in this problem. There are various, we saw, I, I tried to, so th this is the classical way, it's parabolic stochastic quantization, where you study an additional parabolic evolution whose invariant measure is the measure you're interested in. But you can do other kind of stochastic quantization. You can do a, a canonical, what is called canonical or hyperbolic stochastic quantization, because the question is not parabolic anymore. It's a second order in time equation, which is hyperbolic, because you see the second order derivative together with the Laplacian give you a hyperbolic evolution in this additional time, of course, okay? So the time variable is a fixed time, is additional to go back to what you are interested in. You, you need to take the marginal at a given time, but the question is different, okay? And uh, um, at, at, at this date is not clear if this equation is easier, uh, has uh, some advantage over this. Actually, it's more difficult to study. But um, maybe, maybe in the future we understand that actually it's easier. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it, for some way it's easier. Uh, for example, this equation as a wave equation has finite speed of propagation. Okay, while this equation is being parabolic, uh, disturbance propagate with infinite speed. Okay, so there, there are differences, but this is more difficult to study in the context we are interested in. There are some works already. But there are other kind of stochastic quantization. For example, there is one related to elliptic equation, not parabolic ones. And that um, uh, was discovered by Parisian Surlas. And the idea is that you introduce in your problem an additional parameter, which is two dimensional, not a time variable, not an additional time variable, but a two dimensional parameter. And therefore, and you set up your equation in d plus two dimension. 
Euclidean dimension. Okay, now you have a problem in D plus two dimension, which is elliptic. It depends on the original D dimension plus the additional two dimension, which I called Z, but it's an elliptic equation in this, uh, in this extended context, okay? So you have to compare this equation with the parabolic equation. The only difference is that Z is two dimensional and T is one dimensional. And here you have a first order operator while here you have a second order operator, okay? That's the difference. Again, you can prove that uh, with suitable condition, the marginal, when you fix Z to a given point, so the marginal of this random field for fixed Z, so it's still a function of X, is the measure you are interested in. Okay, and that, that's uh, I've written in some paper. I will give you a reference right away. And then there are other ways to do that. It comes to my mind uh, uh, with a student who introduced a variational method, and you can think to this variational method as a stochastic analysis of Euclidean quantum field theories. And in this method, the parameter you have to introduce is an energy scale. And this is also related to renormalization group. But I think I'm a bit late, so I will not enter too much into the detail on this part. Okay, so let me, this was an introductory lecture. I think I, I felt the need to make this point now because then I, I would not enter into them anymore. If you want more, uh, uh, if you want more uh, background, more history about uh, quantum field theories or Euclidean quantum field theories, you can look at the introduction of these papers I've, I co-wrote with other people because they somehow, um, they, in the introduction, we try to make the point and try to give uh, very carefully all the reference they needed to be given which are a lot. So please look, refer to the, to the introduction of this paper if you want to have a background on these matters. And uh, uh, if you are curious about this other stochastic quantization, um, well, the elliptic stochastic quantization is explained here. And uh, uh, the variational method is explained essentially in this paper and the uh, canonical or hyperbolic stochastic quantization, for example, is exemplified in this paper in a, in a specific context, okay? So let me stop here today. Uh, um, I have, uh, so my idea, so let me go back. Uh, my idea for, for uh, the next, uh, so for tomorrow is to explain to you how, so I, I try to motivate what are the topics, so what is Euclidean quantum field theory, what is the problem, that is I want to be able to take these two limits. What is the tool? The tool is stochastic quantization seen as stochastic analysis of quantum field, okay? So the idea is that I want to use this analysis to be able to prove theorems. And tomorrow we will start to prove how you use these ideas to prove the infinite volume limit. So we will send L to infinity, Okay, so this is L to infinity. And, and then uh, we will also maybe start to look at the, the other problem, which is epsilon to zero, and also try to look at properties of the measure. So, but again, okay, the spirit, uh, which is important to me, is that uh, you will see that all the tools I'm using is this idea that uh, the equation links the global picture, that is the object you are interested in study, with a simpler local object, which is the Gaussian free field in our context. So I will use analysis to go from the quantum field theory to the Gaussian free field and to prove things going back to, to a Gaussian free field for which we know a lot of things because it's Gaussian. But this is how actually things works for uh, stochastic analysis, okay? You, you prove things on diffusion by proving things on Brownian motion and by proving things related to stochastic differential equations in many situations. That's not the only tool you have at disposal, but it's a very powerful tool. Okay, so let me stop here. Uh, I'm not sure if 
there are okay. question remarks yes, so, so thank you uh, so we can all then you to thank Massimiliano. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah, I think I, there, there were not very many theorems, so I would not state many theorems. So somehow I, I stated the only theorem I, I hope to prove up to the end, which is somehow describe more in detail what's going on here. Um, and uh, my, my, my stress is uh, try to give you a message about what are the techniques, which I think they are new, not in the sense that uh, they are extraordinarily new, but somehow the point of view, I think it's not very much exploited in the literature. Okay, so that's what, uh, what is new in these lectures, if you want. Okay, okay, so let me stop the recording and